<laughs> Welcome to the Daily B Show, episode 108, with the daredevil Cecilia Mayer. Cecilia has been brought into my life only just recently um, through the amazing Janine Howard and the Empire event that we both attended. But as soon as we met, I was instantly drawn to her, to her energy, to her power, to her confidence. Um, and just and also once we actually met and got time to, to spend a um, bit of time learning about each other and, and sharing each other's stories, hearing Cecilia's story about going from when she was this able-bodied daredevil chick to now, now disabled bodied, still the daredevil within, um, but partner, mother, best friend, wife, and she's just an absolutely beautiful soul. And, and the, the plight that she's gone to in that journey is something that really inspired me and that I know is going to inspire a lot of you guys. So I'm really excited to have her here with us today. Um, and yeah, joining us. So Cecilia, thank you for, for coming here and joining us. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolute pleasure. I've got a little bit of a sniffle, so excuse me if I need to sneeze or snort or bubble or burp as we yeah. go along today. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's nice that you sort of showed up anyway. You probably could be resting. Yeah, healing. absolutely. Well, I just um, actually saw Tom Bilyeu, is he, he runs Impact Theory. He's one of the guys that I model based on this show as well and, and sort of draw a lot of inspiration from. And I saw one of his uh, videos just recently talking about how he was so sick before an interview and how he drew inspiration from Michael Jordan before he went into one of the, the finals. And Michael Jordan was absolutely spent. His temperature was through the roof. He was really, he shouldn't have been doing anything, let alone playing a, a professional game of sport. Um, yeah. But, yeah, to show up like that, like we're just able to draw inspiration from other people that are doing amazing things and hence yeah. why you're here with me today. So, for those that haven't had the pleasure of, of meeting you yet and um, and hearing a bit about you and what you're up to, do you mind sharing, yeah, who you are and just specifically what you're doing at the moment for the world? Okay. Um, hi, all. Uh, Cecilia here. Um, I um, oh, Short story, ended up with the um, right side of physical disability um, and after a, a stroke, um, from a brain tumour and it's been eight years now and I would like to help um, other people going through similar transitions either with um, physical disabilities after they've been a very quite active um, person in particular and um, also not just physical disabilities you're impacted with um, also the loss of identity um, in particular, yeah. is a really common thread. Um, when I um, uh, talk with people about what I want to do and they end up talking about their, let's say, invisible disabilities, yeah. um, a common, big common thread is the loss of identity and what that goes through. And um, I also spent the last three years training as a naturopath and what I got out of that, I took a year off this year to have a break from studies before I pursued more studies. And um, I just had this desire to put together a community and a platform and that I, I can um, help inspire and motivate or mentor that um, people along similar journeys and even create a community where we can all get together and it doesn't have to be people going through the exact same thing but there's just this common underlying thread that um, I'm passionate about getting these people together and sharing and um, enjoying the journey together. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, I mean, talking to you, I don't know that you do, but that similarity between... Even just people, like you said, not doesn't have to be people that have been disabled. Oh, sorry, abled and then disabled. But so many people that are living with abled bodies, but uh, a um, fractured mindset or a fractured sense of identity um, is just that same feeling internally. It's just not as visible externally. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah definitely. So take us back to um, what life was like. 10 years ago, mm. nine, 10 yeah. years ago, what you were up to and, and the life uh, that you were leading. Yeah, so 10 years ago in particular is pretty relevant. Um, I started the Sunshine Coast Roller Derby League, uh, Coastal Assassins Roller Derby, um, we called it. 
<laughs> it's still actually going. They just had their last game of the season last weekend. Yeah, it actually wasn't long enough to go. But, um, uh, yeah, so 10 years um, in into it, it's still going. This is my first year I'd stepped away even um, so after my stroke I stayed present with the league and did some um, off-skate coaching. I just um, uh, just speak out the drills and have someone demonstrating and I was, um, I guess you could say I was a skills Nazi. You just, you got to get those basics and then yeah. you, you can learn, you can do anything. But if you, yeah, if you knuckle down and get So those. can you explain roller derby? Roller yeah. derby? Because I, I didn't even know what it was until I met you. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I've gotten a lot better at spanning this quickly. <laughs> Um, you're on roller skates, you've got a five people from each team on the track at any given time. One skater is the um, point scoring skater um, and that's called the jammer. And the pack of skaters, the, the blockers, the large group of five skaters, um, you've, you get a point for every blocker you pass on the opposing team. So your blockers are trying to keep those other skaters away for it so your jammer can get through okay. um, and you go around a, a loop uh it's like an egg-shaped circle an ovalish yeah. shape um and you have two minutes in one jam unless the jammer can call it off before yeah. the two minutes if they're for a strategic advantage say so they get through twice score points and um, on their second pass, second score points. So if the other jammer was successfully held back by your blockers, they haven't scored any points, then um, your jammer might just keep scoring while they're held and then call it off once the other jammer gets through. So right. a new jam starts. Yeah, That's that was one of my yeah. longest versions, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of like get like a mix between um, the rugby scrums and mm. – um, Rally car racing around the the, the outskirts of the the track, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and ice skating. It's really really intense game, yeah. and it's lots of fun, and it's full contact. Yeah, beautiful. So uh, there's lots of rules, so it takes yeah. a lot to learn. You mm. usually have to train for about a year before you're allowed to play. Like most sports, you rock up on the weekend for your first go, and you're out there on the field giving it a go. Yeah, you know, red yeah. shot, and then um, you're playing a season. And you get a medal, maybe if you're the top three. <laughs> <team. Participation> award. <laughs> um, but yeah, roller derby is um, a bit dangerous. So I guess you'd say it's more on the side of it, an extreme sport. Um, because there is so much danger and room for injury, you've really got to get the basics down. Mm -hmm. uh, even And most people um, are coming at it with um, either not much sporting background because it's, mm -hmm. um, and it's a sport that might interest some people that haven't been drawn to typical sports. They were just, there were a lot of non-sporty people drawn to roller derby mm -hmm. and they all of a sudden realise they've got to get fit, they've got to start being sporty and they either... Um, embrace that or they just don't um, end up oh. participating for very long, yeah. yeah. So what inspired the roller derby to you start that? Are you been doing it for a while yourself or just like, um, so like fuck it, I want to give this a crack? Yeah. Yeah, wicked. <laughs> it, it just looks so much fun. <laughs> like when I first heard about it, yeah. um, I just moved to the Sunshine Coast. I've been living in Brisbane for mm -hmm. years before that and – uh, it was 2009, must have been, I moved to the Sunshine Coast mm. and I found out that I'd been in Brisbane for two years since 2007 yeah. and I'm like, kidding me, I could have spent, I could have been doing this for the past two years. That's like, so I, and I didn't want to drive to Brisbane. You just like <laughs> around the local local street and it's like, all right, this block is the track until we find <laughs> the venue or <laughs> hey, a, a street to me. and just <laughs> start something there. <laughs> block derby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. That's um, something to think about. Yeah, right. Um, Street rules. Yeah. Awesome. That and would so, take up. And you're <laughs> jumping out of planes and doing all sorts of stuff as well. Tell us a yeah, bit more so, about your, your little daredevil time. Uh, apart from 
once I started uh, really going down the rabbit hole with roller derby, that was after about 15 years into skydiving. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of perfect timing, I guess, um, Yeah. Because roller derby started to take over a little bit, and you had to mm. train one of the d- weekend days, whereas I was used to spending all weekend at the drop zone. Um, but at least well. that's one thing that really um, caught my ear with you is I've always wanted to get into a wingsuit. Like I haven't done much um, skydiving before, um, yeah. but that's just something that's really excited me. This the thought and and the um, yeah the thrill of that. I met a few wingsuit flyers in my time. We've got a, a mutual friend that we realise as well. And, yeah. um, and that's something that yeah. I just think is would be the most liberating feeling. So just for my own interest, can you share with me a little bit about that and, and your experiences with wingsuit flying, what that's like? Yeah, so wingsuit flying um, I was always interested in because it's kind of an essential factor for base jumping. I always thought I would end up base jumping. It was definitely a goal. And so you've kind of got to learn how to um, fly a wingsuit before you go base jumping because you need to get some distance. Um, wingsuit really levers you out instead of either going um, yeah. straight down. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, so I started that and um, there was a Sky Sisters event on. Uh, must have, well, It was not long after. It must have been 2006 or 2004. Um, and um, I finished your 12 uh, wingsuit, oh, oh, have it had a lot of wingsuits there mm. for everyone to try and then they thought, oh, well, let's get a um, female record going if we just sub- they just submit the plan of the formation before the jump and then um, there's if there would happen to be judges there because other records were going on and yeah. so we submitted and um, practised the jump and, yeah, we got everyone um, in the formation so I actually was part of a... Nine way Australian female um, wingsuiting record. Done. Awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. All right. And so um, that must have scared the crap out of your parents and all the people that loved you, knowing that you're jumping off cliffs and jumping off buildings and jumping out of uh, airplanes. And... Well, I didn't. Uh, they knew I wanted to base them, but I actually didn't get to do it. Um, right before my. Um, my stroke, actually, we, my husband and I decided what we're we going to do. Are we going to go on a base jumping holiday or are we going to, we had unsuccessfully um, fallen, tried, been trying to fall pregnant for nearly two years and we're like, oh, do we go down the IVF route? It's an expense and or do we go and just have a holiday in Switzerland or somewhere and go learn to base jump? And well, we just, like, decided on, well, let's try one round of IVF and if it doesn't work, let's do the rest on the base jumping. Yeah, <laughs> and, <cool>. uh, <laughs> Yeah, so the IVF actually worked that first time. So, um, yeah, it didn't end up happening. Yeah, <laughs> wasn't the plan. And what's your partner's name? Uh, Ryan. Ryan, right. Yeah, I've seen a lot of beautiful photos as I've been stalking you the last few days. <laughs> creating some images and, and checking you out which yeah. has been awesome um so shout out to ryan and yeah and your your son yeah uh, nixon nixon that's right yeah cool how old's nixon now he's six just okay. turned not long ago how do you love yeah. your brother six years in i do yeah yeah it's a bit of a journey within itself uh, <laughs> yeah. um but a beautiful one um yeah he's probably taught me a lot Probably. Um, more than I would have known, he could have taught me in six years. A lot yeah. about acceptance. Like, yeah, okay. Beautiful thing about children of that age, they just um, accept, you know, ifs and or buts and he didn't, yeah. Let's get, let's, um, <laughs> let's come back to that because that's, that is um, a part of, a big part of the conversation we had when we first met was obviously going through the journey of, um, mm. of your stroke and and coming out to the world the way you were and and really for yourself and your identity learning about that and, and accepting yourself but can mm. you yeah can you share that journey and that story of um of how this all came about and yeah right from the start ah how um how they 
the desire to do this part of the journey came about or well I'm also oh yeah but to start with like how um someone so fit and healthy and environment in life had a stroke at such a young age what that mm. what that journey okay. was like yeah yeah um so I was oh yeah I was 34 and I was very fit um because we I'd just started roller derby. I was training about three times a week. Um, I'd stopped drinking. Um, well, I stopped smoking when I was 24, so that had been 10 years before. Um, and I wasn't drinking. And lots of, yeah, lots of fitness. So when I um, was getting these sensations of numbness and I was at, actually at a roller derby meeting um, and I couldn't I put a pen in my right hand and I'm like, oh, my fingers feel really um, pins and needly. Um, I asked my best friend that I started the league with, um, she was um, also on the um, uh, board, uh, she was secretary. Um, and I went to take notes. I brought, I always take notes anyway. And I'm like, oh, can you just take the notes for me? Um, uh, yeah, and she didn't think anything of it. But, you know, in hindsight, like I couldn't write. I couldn't hold a pen and write. And I got into the car. Someone gave me a lift that, that day. And I, I was wearing thongs and walking out to the car. And I remember them just flicking off to the right. I couldn't control the thong under my foot. So it was a very slow onset and it wasn't an obvious stroke. Like usually stroke, you got a, you know, face, arms, smile. Yeah. I could still smile. My face wasn't drooping. My arms are still working except for I couldn't. It's just the fine, the fine dexterity of holding a pen. I'm like, yeah. So the next day I woke up and the thong was falling off more and I went to a um, my GP uh, sorry, I went to the emergency room and was giving them a rundown and they just said, oh, you need to see a neurologist. So go to your GP and get an appointment. I went to my GP and told him all the same stuff and what was described, everything, and he's like, oh, my goodness, you need to be admitted straight away. I'm like, well, i just been sent away from the hospital. They said to get an appointment with a neurologist and he's like, no, that will take too long. You need investigation right now. Um, I'm like, it's okay. So finally, like I know I've been having these little things happening um, over a few months. So, um, so how long there was a few brain. months? What have been going on for a few um, months? They weren't lasting for a few months, but say about three months before that in June, there might be this pulsating feeling in my calf, but it wasn't sent, It wasn't on the skin. It wasn't on the muscle. It was really in the middle. Mm. And it just felt really weird. It would throb and be unlike any other sensation I've had and but it might last just 15 minutes and it was gone so you've got nothing yeah. to present nothing to walk to so but sneaky. I'd always mention it yeah or like half of my just the right side of my mouth the lips yeah. would go numb for like one or two three days max um one time I went to the ER would have been May of 2011 and I was having this burning sensation go travel up my mouth and then down my arm, down to my fingertips, back up my arm, down my body, down my leg, to my foot. And that was lasting like two and a half hours. Fuck. And it was probably half an hour or an hour before I decided to go to the hospital. I'm like, this is lasting longer than everything's usually done. This is too weird. And I was Did getting, you check anything before that? Like that, throughout that month, did you, did you really speak to anyone else or...? Did you go to see the GP and they sort of pushed it under the rug for not being anything or? Uh, that time when I went, when it was the lasting longer than usual and there'd been a few little episodes that would go in within 15 minutes, that was the first time I went to a GP. Then a month later, it happened again. So mm. uh, sorry, the first time I went to ER, the second time I went to a GP and they said, well, I don't know, it could be the early signs of MS, but... If it's still happening in six months, um, oh. come back. <laughs> yeah, so both of them nah, said. Nah, fuck that. Deal with it now. 
<laughs> yeah. So then I went to my, I broke my back the year before and I thought it could do related to that. I thought maybe yeah. I'm just having these weird things yeah, like going on in my or something just pinching or Yeah. Mm. So then I, um, I, that was my like, what grasping at straws, thinking mm. I was, I'm too much <laughs> of a positive person in that regard. So I just want to think the best. Um, <laughs> it, it does serve <laughs> you for my the most part, um, it's, it's all good. Nothing's going on. Um, so I went to the orthopedic checkup, um, for 12 months in after my break and he's like, no, it's happening in both, um, sections of your body above, um, yeah. spine, like a upper half and lower half. So in that case, he's, uh, he said I need to see a neurologist um, at that point. That was the first mention of it. Mm. Um, he's like, if your next checkup's in six months, if it's still happening another six months, um, we will put you onto a neurologist here. But um, And that was October 2011. And then November 2011, I had the, bleed, the bigger episode. So... Um, and even that in itself was a gradual process. There was the um, the pen dexterity, mm. the walking in thongs, and the, oh, yeah. And when my doctor said, "Hang on, you need to go to a um, hospital," I went back to the ER that sent me away, and they said, "No, we've sent you away." I'm like, "Nah, <laughs> I finally like it might be a bit slow. I need to hit a big roll." But I'm like, "No, I'm not leaving this place until you check out what well, everything that my GP said is." a bit scary and I'm now I know something's going on and I want it checked out um I said I can't repeat all the um, medical words my GP just used so please call him and the receptionist got the doctor out and he got my GP's name and number went back and they had a conversation and I got admitted and sent out the back and then transferred to a private hospital and an MRI the next day revealed um, a brain tumour, actually. Um, and so that's how a healthy person can have a, um, a stroke because it wasn't a normal stroke. I didn't have an aneurysm burst or um, artery or, yeah, I had this benign brain tumour on the left side of my head that gave the right side of my body all the problems. Oh, okay. Um, and I pr it was a benign brain tumour, but I was most likely born with it mm. and this particular tumor is called a cavernous hemangioma or a cavernous angioma before it bleeds or hemangioma after it bleeds and yeah. <laughs> and so the walls of that tumor um would have got uh, maybe weakened and maybe that's a hypothesis as mm. that it was weakened by the ivf drugs and oh. that's when the big bleed happened um, it's not concrete, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but there's studies um, being done by um, researchers about the amount of ladies on IVF drugs that have then had their cavernous angioma bleed. Yeah. And so they look for the link between that. That's, yeah. that's almost like a, um, like a soul contract between you <laughs> and your son, it's like, it's like, mm. all right, mum, if you want me to come down, you, there's a price you got to pay. <laughs> mm. that, that's pretty full on. Um, so, do you do you feel, um, or had, did I say like if we had have done an MRI at any other point, that's something mm. like those benign tumors can be found and can be yeah. So in. Interestingly, say that my GP, because he knew my story and my symptoms and everything after the fact, because um, mm. I actually didn't tell him earlier in the year, but um, so he actually saw the symptoms in another of his patients mm. and was able to get an MRI before his big bleed. He This patient was coming to him going, I've had this, this, that's going on, and he's like, right straight away MRI and he'd had um, preventative surgery and got it taken out. Um, How you feel? <laughs> ah, it's bittersweet. Double-edged sword, I've, I've helped someone. Yeah, just by happening to go to the GP I went to and 
going through what I went through, it's um, saved someone else mm -hmm. from going through it. So that's good. <laughs> but hindsight, you know, it's, it's you don't know. If I've had preventative surgery, it comes with its own risks anyways, brain surgery. Like I had like that much of my skull healed over and then the cut into and I'm demonstrating this side because um, there that's the side the yeah. tumor was um, and my skull was cut and then lifted out and then they did the thing and took the tumor out and diathermied all the bleeding signs like mm. that's a heat for it. like like they're just you know blasting it with heat mm. and then they put my skull back on and Stitched me up. I had this hell scar. It's pretty punk. Did you see that when you were taking the photo? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's full on. It's, it's barbaric um, almost, but so delicate and um, and amazing at the same time. Yeah. So they um, when I went to think about what would happen if I'd have found it, if I'd have listened to my warning signs, if I'd have demanded an MRI from the doctor, but thought, oh, maybe it's an MS. If yeah. I I mean, really, I put the onus back on me. And another thing, I would just would love everyone to get get in touch with yourself, listen to yourself. You know you, mm. and be your own. Um, you, you, we we put a lot of faith in you, the medical profession, and not enough faith in ourselves. Hundred percent. Like your body is phenomenal. It it pushes yeah. parts out of it that it doesn't want to be in there. It, it turns, yeah. you know, pieces of food yeah. into human being. Like it's a magical, it's a magical system. And, um, yeah, I definitely yeah. affirm that and attest to that as well. Like it's, it's crazy how disconnected that so many people are and that I definitely was for a long time and, and I'm continuing to practice getting more in yeah. touch with, with those feelings and trusting that, um, and accept mm. like this acceptance, which we'll get into as well a little bit, but, um, mm. That's huge, and and I'm sure that yeah, like a, just from your story, I know that you <laughs> implore people to go out there and really take um, the smallest um, sensation seriously, and to get them checked out sooner rather than later because yeah. you know, it can't hurt if there's nothing there, <laughs> but it can if there yeah. is. Um, and I think there has been a bit of a shift in ten years for sure. Hmm. Um, the um when i tell my story to a lot of time i'm going in for whatever reason and the particular radiologist go oh, what happened and tell my story well and um they say oh well it wouldn't have been missed if it happened these days because they check they send people for scans over nothing mm -hmm. um but they didn't do that they had the mindset that they needed to save money and don't send people for mris because they're oh, still there in six months come back <laughs> yeah yeah Fuck that. <laughs> no oh. I'm calm yeah. down. Meanwhile, yeah. keep playing your way. Mm. So could you put in some extra orders with the brain surgery? Like, can you just rewire the money part <laughs> and just maybe make me a really good <laughs> cook as well? And Yeah. <laughs> well, you're in I there. I think we're going to the stage where you can, well, that's happening and they put in a little chip that links all everything. Yeah. Instead of, like, like basically I was a, my brain, the, you know, computer chip was soldered. Was, mm. I literally got soldered. I could have connected a microchip. Just I, in the Google Maps in there. And <laughs> just... <laughs> that would have been cool. That, yeah, we're not far off that, hey. <laughs> All the AI. All in good time. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's that's full on. And um, I've got a, a really close friend that's gone through a similar process as well. She... Did, she does have MS and she's gone through brain mm -hmm. surgery and, and had her own her own complications and, and her own yeah. journey. And um, it's it's frightening. It's it's scary. Mm -hmm. Like when you you mess around with that stuff. And um, I mean, it's great that we we can be here now. And like you've had eight years to come to terms with your disability, but to, to come to yeah. terms and and reshape um, your identity really, which is is what it is. Like you're still you're still you, right? You just got yeah. <laughs> um, different abilities now, and um, 
but at, but during those times, that's that's some scary times. That's really really scary, especially for like yeah, yeah your partner, your son, and and all your friends and family. That would have been hor- horrifying. Well, yeah, for sure. Um, I think it, it took its own um, toll and stress and health in my husband too. Like yeah, but yeah, um, I think yeah, he started getting migraines and what not like stress is like huge and yeah. it comes in all different forms and for different reasons for mm. different people um uh something i realized i didn't answer before when you mentioned your friend with ms and you'd gone through her own surgery but when i was talking about um prevent if i had had preventative mm. surgery it's got its own risks and you never know what that would have happened. I could have done that and I could have ended up blind. Like you're yeah. that close to all those little things. And I actually know of someone who had preventative surgery for an aneurysm that hadn't burst, but um, it was, you know, there was a pretty high chance it was going to. And there's risk with um, every surgery, let alone brain surgery. And, yeah, this particular patient and was ended up blind. So... Yeah, there's hind, hindsight's twenty twenty, and to think I oh, wish I had a chance to have preventive surgery. Um, well, not only did my tumour bleed once, but it actually bled the second time um, two weeks later. So then I go down the rabbit hole of well, why didn't we do the surgery after the first bleed? Mm. Um, there's lots of complications. I was pregnant. I was five weeks, six weeks pregnant. Um Oh, so you were pregnant yeah. at this stage. You hadn't even had, um, had far out. That's for long as well. So I, I um, was going through rehab. I was um, – they're waiting to see if they do do surgery after the second bleed because I was – maybe I was eight weeks pregnant then, but I actually started uterine bleeding. Mm. And um, I don't want to took you into a stressful situation and maybe you come out – with whatever happens in brain surgery plus losing your baby. So they wanted to monitor the bleeding um, mm. before they went in and it was just steady, it was slow and um, they monitored it for like two weeks and it was the same. So like, well, we've kind of got to make the decision to either do this or we don't want you to have another bleed. Um, with cavernous angiomas, they sometimes and most of them, they don't bleed at all and they don't have an impact. I've, if mine hadn't have bled, I wouldn't have known. I had a, I'd never had a CT or an MRI of my head before, so I didn't know it was there. Um, uh, so I um, went ahead with the surgery. Um, I agreed I don't want another one. Um, a significantly, I could still move my fingers after um, um, my first bleed, and this is my left hand. <laughs> Um, and this is my right hand after the second bleed. I can't, I can't extend my fingers. I can curl them in a bit, but it takes a lot of effort. But there's no functional use. And my wrist on my right hand, um, I can't. You need your wrist action and your opening and closing and pronate and supinate to be able to functionally use your hand. So after the second bleed, um, it's so much more was lost um, that it was um, it was a no-brainer as to whether we do that surgery now or not. So how did your um, how do you feel looking back now that your your mindset of and the kind of person that you were assisted you throughout that process? Like you're you're a ballsy ballsy bitch, man. Like to do the stuff <laughs> that you did, it takes you know, like that's the top few percent that are willing to take those those physical risks and to to seek that that adventure and to to seek that thrill but really like that's that's crossing the precipice and, and be willing to take those big leaps um mm. and survive some pretty extreme emotion like physically and mentally emotional mm. states just to do the the activities that you were doing on a regular basis so um, yeah. I probably need to thank my sister because she put me in training my whole life. I had a four-year older sister, mm-hmm. and when I was What's playing, maybe Priscilla. Hey, Priscilla. <laughs> so she put me in a flimsy Fisher Price trolley, and our driveway sloped down, and um, pushed me down, <laughs> and I fell out 
on that and um, got three or four stitches under my chin um, that day. <laughs> well, on that as and, well, like um, it's isn't it um, for the stuff that you were doing? It's profound that you didn't have an incident where you needed to get an MRI that that whole time. As well. Like to avoid an MRI for someone that's doing that is that's <laughs> unheard of. I reckon. <laughs> Yeah. Well, when I broke my back the year before, I probably should have got scanned then. They asked me if I hit my head and I'm like, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't really remember. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, alarms, go send me for an MRI. Um, I actually, like, um, tore my um, – I did a try tear of the knee, the three things. Um, that's medial, meniscus, your – yeah, all of those. <laughs> and um, they didn't notice that for uh, quite a while until um, they got me to stand up for an X-ray. Mm. I'm like, I can't, this is really painful. I'm like, no, not in my back, my knee. And then they looked at my knee and saw the or three um, tendons, ligament tear. Um, How did you do that again? <laughs> uh, so when I was skydiving, um, I made the mistake of... Jumping without my altimeter, which tells you the height, um, and um, I, I grabbed a different helmet last second and I didn't have my audible altimeter, so I'm just so used to having that. And um, I jumped out and I wasn't really thinking. Um, I think I turned to my... Um, I'm uh, just trying to remember now, but that, let's say I jumped without these things and you don't do that if you're in the plane and you realise you should just go down with the plane. So I jumped anyway um, and just thought, well, when my when the person jumps with me, usually they just wave off at a certain height, it's just normal, and then they turn 180 degrees and track off and you go zoom the opposite way and then deploy your parachute. So I was like, oh, well, when wave... When he waves off, um, I'll just know we're at that height then. But he, we hadn't really talked and he had decided that he was going to watch me deploy my parachute. So he's, like, waiting for me to wave off and I'm waiting for him to wave off. And, yeah, so I ended up um, deploying my parachute like because he's just, oh, fuck this, my dinner's beeping like crazy in my ear. Um, I'm going to go in. And that was I vlogged his video, his um, footage of the jump and that was like mm, what well, was the it was probably at two grand and you're falling pretty quick um so you've only got a few seconds before it's one grand um so I literally flipped over realized we were low and um deployed my parachute but my your reserve parachute is set to deploy at a certain height if you do not deploy a parachute. So if you get knocked unconscious, it's going to deploy your parachute. So I ended up with two parachutes out, my main oh, and my God. reserve. And I've seen, yeah, I've seen what this looks like a couple of times. I've seen someone land successfully with two side by side, just fly in, just, um, um, and they dealt with it really well. And luckily, um, and the other one was fine for ages and you're just like, you're just watching going, oh. And then at the last minute they came down so that I'm trying to do both hands being parachuted so they're like this and then they biplane. So do that with the other hand like this and like that. Yeah. So you got your hands are the two different parachutes and that, can, that just spins you, turns you in, yeah. yeah. So that the person I saw that happen to, it happened really low and they only got like a turn and they were on the ground and they were safe and they were fine. So both experiences um, lend, ended well. Um, but now okay. I've got two, two open and um, they were stacked uh, when I looked up and I decided to... So it's sort of like that. Yeah, I decided to cut away with my main... Oh, I wish I had a video camera on this jump, but I didn't. Um, and my main, were they? Yeah, it cleared away, it left. And, like, luckily, because that could have gone bad too, if the main tangled up with my reserve and, yeah, um, 
see ya. Yeah. Um, didn't happen. Had a reserve to um, fully inflate it. So I went to release my brakes because your brakes are set um, on your canopy when they're open. So your canopy is flying the slowest um, it'll fly. Mm. And then you release your brakes, you let your canopy fly full. Um, and I released and one side wouldn't release like I like got one out and I couldn't get the other other side out um, for some reason. So I had to, um, I was pretty low to the ground. I didn't have much time. I'm like, well, I need to f- stop flapping around with these brakes and I need to figure out where's the wind coming from, where am I going to land. I'm miles off the drop zone. I mean, farmer territory, there's trees, there's hills, there's cows, there's fences. Uh, I need to sort out where I'm going to land and then I can give get it releasing my brake one last red hot kick. Um, I'm literally coming into land. I'm like, no, nah, it's not budging. I've got to land in um, brake mode, which isn't ideal because you're not getting a full performance from your canopy. Yeah. And the reserve canopy is also already docile. So um, when I come into land, I went to flare. Um, basically, your, your flare's already started for you because some um, brakes. And when I go to flare, um, I probably just put too much oomph into it because um, it stalled the canopy and then I just dropped out of the sky. So I was fairly low to the ground, was maybe a knee height kind of drop. Um, so obviously my legs are already near on ground. I just kind of touched down but in a stalling mode, so it was momentum of a pendulum and it slammed me to my back. Oh. That's how it broke my back and you've got your... Um, r- rig on that's hard mm. and then compressing my back and between my back and the ground and just yeah compressed and I got four fractures um on my spine fucking um nice. down there <laughs> um but I jumped again six months later they gave me six months off jumping and six months off jumping how kind of them <laughs> <laughs> To the day I jumped six months later. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. I'm just setting up the, um, my phone here as well so I can see um, if there's any comments coming through from people. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. We're live. Yeah. So <laughs> funnily enough, I was um, in a pair of roller skates on that jump. There was um, a recipe for disaster. Like disasters don't happen just because of one thing. They're usually yeah. a series of events, which is my altimeter, my dinner, because I grabbed a roller derby helmet I'm like, instead and because um, I'd won this roller derby competition, I think. They'd um, to do the jump, you had to do send a some picture of you um, in your roller derby gear. And so I went for a skydive with my roller derby gear, but I took my ditter in that jump. Um, and then when I won the competition, um, I did a, that was a, to be a photo shoot to say thank you this is me jumping my helmet that I just won um and the, yeah that was the fateful event um just quickly grabbed yeah it was like get on a load you're supposed to be on the one later oh you've got room on this load go on that load oh go to go quick so then you're rushing it's something you shouldn't rush uh, so many rest, little things leading up that I could have should have would have you know yeah of course yeah. Yeah, again, <laughs> all, the, all the coulda, shoulda, wouldas in the world. Yeah. 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 Okay, epic. <laughs> let's let's jump in. So, into, hey, I, uh, in answering your question, you, so you said leading up to that is um, how did that lifestyle prepare you for dealing with the stroke? Um, and I guess it was a good um, thing to talk about, that malfunction and how it all happened because in um, any – extreme sport but especially skydiving when you you are dealing with life or death situations you've got to um think and act then and there um and you 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 can't freeze it's like okay what do i do now this has happened what do i do now and i guess that happened after my stroke okay this has happened what do i do now yeah you you know it's like it's not just buckle in and freeze and what was me? What happened to me? It was like oh, this happened. What I do now? Uh, I guess I'm, I was such a practice mindset mm-hmm. in fifteen mm-hmm. years of skydiving that it just became how I responded to a malfunction of my body. 
Now, what was my next question is how, like, how, how much importance do you put on the practice and the lead up to those events? Um, practice and lead up to to well Sorry. anything you want to do in life really to just to give you that edge and to give you that um, that yeah ability to do that to go all right I know that this has happened I've got to do that I've got to look look forwards and figure out how I can make the best of this situation moving forward yeah I guess with um, skydiving they train you from day one mm. about potential malfunctions and how to recognize them and what you do and. And it's enough to turn some people off <laughs> if they don't go through with it. Yeah, you um, just watch a YouTube video and see someone crashing into a building <laughs> or falling down a hill and it's like, nah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, but um, other people, and I guess um, the people that um, currently to this day um, survive and are living at um, old age after base jumping because um, you don't get a lot of old base jumpers. Um, but they acknowledge the um, dangers before every jump they do and um, it's when you get complacent, which maybe I was the day I had that accident, that's when things can happen and I think the people that are getting old base jumping, they're acknowledging the danger every time and they are triple checking and double checking and choosing the days that they jump and... And I think that's definitely important um, in um, going through and making it in that um, in that stage in that realm. Mm. Um, and then the skills that that brings to day to day life. Um, how obvious. Complacency. How, how dangerous is that complacency with your health then as well? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Transfer is over so well. Mm. Um, yeah. And yeah. so many people are complacent with their health um, or not listening to their body. Their body's screaming at them, mm. this, 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 and um, just ignoring it, push it to the side. No, well, everyone wants, like we are by nature, look for the, we just want to see the, the best and the, it's not wrong nothing's wrong it's fine push it aside i've got this and this to do uh, i can't get caught up in that i don't have time for it yeah. it's all good yeah carry on think positively and, and it'll go away <laughs> yeah tell, tell me about the aftermath because that, that's um i think we're I mean, it's, 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 the whole thing has been powerful and it's powerful, the aftermath as well. And hearing about your journey from, yeah, just going, all right, this has happened. The parachute's fucked up. I've just had a stroke. <laughs> this is where it's at. What What's happening moving forward and, and um, incorporating that with your the complete um, shift in your identity as well and, and how that came about and how you handled that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um. This is a long journey. Have we got seven years? No. <laughs> um, okay, so after that brain surgery, um, I came out of the surgery and was put in um, ER just to be monitored as you are. That's just normal after um, a brain surgery. And um, I could not talk. Uh, so that was pretty scary because um, mm. I'm pregnant and in that moment not knowing if I'm going to be able to talk. Am I so going to be able to talk? sitting there literally just you, like nothing was happening. Oh. Ah. Um, I could hear everything that was going on. Um Doctors had come, so I could communicate by nodding or shaking. It was a game of 21 questions. Um, uh, I couldn't feel sensory, like if um, anyone came and touched my arm or held my hand or the leg. I had no idea unless I looked at it, and that was a really weird sensation. Um, but speech was... Um, that was um, really crazy because I'd already lost, you know, walking and 
uh, using my arm on the use of my right leg. So to lose ability to talk uh, was definitely huge and spun me the most um, out, you know, um, into, you know, where your mind goes. Um, so was death a, a thought that came up? Like is this like is this the lead up to me dying or anything like that? Or? Uh, interestingly, no. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think about dying. Um, yeah. I didn't – it's weird that you say that. I didn't think about that. People would come to me, oh, my God, you're so lucky. <laughs> uh, I really thought death would have been the lucky option. Was so, that thought, or was that a thought of taking your own life at any time? I never had a conscious plan, but I'd, again, complacency came in. Mm. It was more, I went through rehab, um, um, my speech started to come back, so that's good. After uh, uh, was, I was in rehab for three months and I didn't get a speech therapist when I left, but I had one I was seeing oh, a few days a week in, yeah. in full-time rehab. So um, gradually I, and I, I actually spoke with an accent back then. Mm. Um and uh, <laughs> it's something my speech therapist asked me, would you like me to teach you how to pronounce words with an Australian accent? I'm like, no, <laughs> this accent's awesome. <laughs> it's the best thing to come out of it. <laughs> um, I gradually, <laughs> as my, my muscles in my mouth and my tongue and everything that enables you to speak um, got stronger, then I was able, or well, my accent gradually dropped away. So people that just meet me now and haven't heard my voice before don't notice it. But I think people every now and then now, people ask me where my accent's from, where was I from. Um, but back in the first year, people ask me every time. I go to the shops because live on Sunshine Coast, yeah. travel destination. Oh, yeah. where are you travelling from? Oh, you sound uh, somewhere in Europe because it was like European but you couldn't place it or it was South Africa and I got told or New Zealand or have you, were you born in South Africa but travelled a lot? So, yeah. yeah. I'm an innovator. I'm making up my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't, oh, I didn't, I never had the um, audacity to play with it and have fun with people. So I, I did a lot told them the honest reason. I just had a stroke and this is how I've learned to talk again. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> I just like, oh, oh yeah. good. Isn't that funny? So, and, and that's a great segue because so many people struggle to know how to approach um, like death or trauma mm -hmm. or um, things that people go through and they it's just like they freeze up and they don't know how to deal with it. But yeah. let's get stuck into that and share with me what <laughs> – the transition has been like seeing people that have well, the way people treated you as an able-bodied person and now <clears throat> coming coming into this world what it's like getting around the general public and what are some of the really big noticeable differences you've seen mm. yes um so before i was disabled um I didn't have um, people disabled in my life. Um, it just wasn't in my realm, whereas, you know, I meet people now that have um, brother, sister or friends and it's much more in my realm now, but it wasn't yeah. around or spoken about or anything. Mm. Um, so my experience as an able-bodied person um, uh, was definitely a gung-ho, out there person, a few tattoos and, yes, very, um, you know, in public and in the general public, you get the passing judgments and um, just the usual, um, if I'm at work, um, the rudeness that a customer could be and they just 
feel that if you stuff up their order as a waitress or, you know, it was a chef, but you're the delivery person of that meal, mm. and they'll really get, in, get stuck into you about what happened with that meal. And since I've been disabled, no one, not a single person have gotten stuck into me. Mm. Tell a lie. One guy did because he didn't know I was disabled. I pulled up in a disabled park. Yeah. As I do, um, and I know in seating, all your viewers will be looking at me going, well, how disabled is she? But, yeah, my right arm doesn't work at all and my left leg, I can't move my toes, so I walk a bit funny and I physically can't run. But, anyway, I pulled up into the car park and this guy just pulled up beside me. I opened my door and he'd just been in the, walked around the front of my car and he goes, you know, this is a disabled park. You shouldn't park here. <laughs> And I was like, I was having an emotional day, so I didn't handle it very well. And I just like shut the door. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm disabled. <laughs> I just walked away in front of him and then he watched my walk and saw it all. And he was like, Ooh. like he hurried up behind me and was like, I'm so sorry, so sorry. And I'm like, yeah, I know, dude, but, you know, that's why I had that disabled pass on my windshield and that's why I parked there. Because I like, go, oh, just, yeah, I wish I'd have said to him, and if he's watching, maybe he's watching your show and he's remembering this moment, I'd like to say sorry and keep going, keep fighting the fight because it's really annoying that other people park in these spots just to run in and grab a yeah. keg of beer, yeah. uh, carton of beer from the bottle shop, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and they come out and pull out, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, keep fighting the fight, keep bringing it to people's attention that you just shouldn't park in these books. <laughs> so, yeah, there's um, one person when they didn't realise I was disabled. But, yeah, generally people are just treat me with this bubble of um, kindness, respect, um, sympathy, empathy. Um, they can see, like, most commonly... Um, it's when you're in public out at the shops, especially when I had m my son in a pram, mm. um, going over gutters, having trolley, um, and then an active toddler, and yeah. and managing <laughs> this with my mum. Um, <laughs> 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 and they either they they can see your disability and they don't know how to approach you, so they ignore you and just give you space, or they see it and go. I want to I wanna help. And they instantly go, oh, how can I help? Or some people don't even ask. They just start doing it. And it's yeah. like, whoa, that was really confrontational at first. Yeah. Some people ask, can I help you? And um, Because you yeah, said as well, like, you're, you're not the kind of person that asks for help. Or that ever, like, you actually no. went specifically hard to do that. So if everyone could dote yeah. on you, that was a, yeah. even, like going back to the identity yeah. crisis, like that's a big mm -hmm. thing you needed to get used to, yeah? Yep, huge. That was huge. Like. I don't ask for help. I just do stuff. I get shit done and um, something to that my parents often um, find frustrating and probably even with my whole stroke and rehab process um, yeah. that I didn't want too much help. But um, <laughs> yeah. I obviously had to ask for it and I, I, I learned to ask for it and accept it a lot better as years went on. Yeah. There was definitely stages um within that mm. um so yeah to be able to um and now i said as now a gift to the stranger if i can gracefully accept the help yeah. they it's pretty huge for them to have even stepped into the space to ask me if i want help like these days uh, people just don't take um being approached by a stranger very well so no. um for me to just go, even though I don't need it anymore, like always, like I'm pretty capable of getting a trolley down a gutter with one hand and loading the um, car with groceries, but um, some quite often it's older men um, um, or women, um, you know, that older generation that will um, offer help. Yeah. And, um, and now I just go, yeah, you know what, that would make my day. Thank you so much and thank you for taking time um, to even offer and help me. 
And so, yeah, just yesterday, actually, a lady helped me pack my, I was scanning everything and then putting in the bag and, you know, she helped organize my bag and put some things in for me and, um, yeah. That's so sweet. Just, and, and it really is, like you said, it goes two ways. Like you can't have giving without receiving. It's the one energy expressed mm-hmm. two different ways. And yeah. for people yeah. that are like, oh, I don't like to receive or I don't like to get help, it's like mm-hmm. you're actually, yeah, like blocking that energy off. Like the when someone wants to give you something, that's a gift. If you receive it, you're giving them that gift of giving. Yeah. And that makes everyone feel beautiful when, when you're able to give someone something or to help someone with something, that makes you feel amazing. So to, to sort of stop someone from, from having that is, is really rough as well. So it's um it's a beautiful yeah. thing to allow people to give in that space. Yeah. So, yeah, to come down that road, I, uh, previously I was a giver. I would give, 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 but I wasn't good at receiving, um, mm. asking for help and accepting it. Um, so that's another, another positive outcome of everything yeah. so far. Um, but, yeah, um, enveloped with that kindness I now receive from complete strangers and I can accept um, uh, their gift to me and yeah. by doing that um, um, it's a gift to them as well. makes their day. I imagine like, yeah. someone being grateful for them taking the chance on a stranger offering help. Yeah, so, being recognised. And you would see yeah, like that- the... the- beautiful side of of humanity and society like having people come out of their shells like that and one thing that i do a lot of is even just smile and say hello to people walking down the street you walk past to pass someone and they've seemed like they've got this serious face on like they could be some sort of murderer so you don't want to interact with them just in case you never know what kind of crazy is walking up past you (laughs) But as soon yep. as you open up um, your space and say hello to people, people jump out of their skins to say yeah. hello. Like they're so yeah. eager and so keen to to have a beautiful yeah. interaction with someone that when you are the one yeah. that steps up and gives them that opportunity, that the world is full predominantly of absolutely phenomenal, amazing, beautiful people. But because mm. we've we're doted with all this media and all this um, like bad horror stories of of things going on around us it seems like that's the that's the most common thing that's happening but in actual fact you're surrounded by the most beautiful amazing people and if you just open up and be the person to step out and give them the opportunity to step up they will 100 percent, they will for for sure and one thing i started thinking about um quite a lot of these help and stories were at supermarkets and then one day um a guy was going off at the lady at the um, inf- uh, that help desk. Um, she wouldn't refund like a gift card or something. He didn't have the right blah, blah, whatever. He's like, <clears throat> like just going bacak at her. And I realised I'm, I'm getting help and kindness left, right and centre because I'm obviously physically disabled. And able-bodied people, everyone feels like it's their right that they can just be complete assholes yeah. or, you know, just go off at someone, be it the ticket police at the help desk or a restaurant, you know, waiter or a travel agent with they soft up a booking, you know, we're all human. Ability or disability, we all deserve kindness and respect and just, you just don't know. Everyone's got a story, whether they're physically disabled or not abled. Yeah. They're all going through something. I don't know anyone that isn't gone through something um, and you don't know what's happening on that particular day for that person and how your interaction with them is going to spark for them. So it may as well be kind and respectful. And if nothing else, just stick there. Don't say anything if you if you can't. Just don't be a dick. <laughs> don't be a dick. Number one roller roller derby was don't be a douche. That was <laughs> <laughs> absolutely love it. And so with that, is there? I mean, that that's basically the message to deliver today, isn't it? Is that um, abled or disabled, we are all in our own um, in our own form of of life, going through our own challenges. Um, some of them are physical, some of them are, are intangible, but it doesn't take away the value and the, the severity of each individual's plight in, in their own journey. 
And so yeah. approaching everyone with that love and that kindness, just like you would someone that you see who who needs that help and assistance who might be disabled, um, so too might the seemingly abled person behind the cash register or walking down the street yeah. where internally they could be more disabled than someone that is paralysed within their whole body. So um, is there, is, yeah. is there something you'd like to share on that or, or really, yeah, just drive that message home? Uh, just drive it home. I've realised that being on both ends of um, both sides of disability and able-bodied, I've kind of had a, a unique um perspective into that and um, I know that's not their only perspective but um, it's one of them and it might help people just to to actually be kind like you can see it left right and centre and lots of memes and whatever but you don't actually have an impact or kind of have a context of it yeah. um, until maybe someone spells out their um, context so mm-hmm. yeah, I, um, yeah I hope people catch on to that um no doubt they are well you already have yeah. an impact on people around you i know that because i'm one of them and yeah. um, not to mention the people that you know by second and third de- third degree like the the guy who was able to get that surgery through your doctor and and people yeah. that might be listening to this that just needed that extra um affirmation and and understanding about themselves so um i yeah. love what you're doing and what you're about and just yeah just the person you are and, and the impact yeah. you're going to have on so many lives with your coaching and your mentoring with these groups you're putting together as well the people at the roller derby and and all the other groups that you're attending as well i know that just your presence is their presence <laughs> as cheesy as it is but it, it really, really <laughs> is so yeah yeah thank you so much for opening up and, and being here to share that and and to share your gift with us and with whoever else um, is able to catch on to this and just, yeah, keep playing forwards. If I can do anything to, to assist you as well, just, yeah, reach out and, yeah, looking forward to seeing what the future holds on. Yeah, and thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me here today and just to have this chat. It <laughs> was, um, yeah, was, was great. Thank you. No worries, man. Take it easy, guys. Looking forward to seeing you guys on the next episode and, yeah, connect with, uh, with Cecilia. Cecilia, where's probably the best place to connect with you on, on Facebook? For people that want to reach uh, out? Yeah, you, um, Facebook Cecilia Mayor Speaker is my page. Um, I think you've already got a link to my journal page, so you're Didi yeah. Mayor, um, but that will also have a... Um, cool. I'll put these links in the description as well. Yeah. 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 And um, if people wanted to want to work with you or know more about the groups, what's the best place... Yeah, email uh, Cecilia Mayor 1080 at gmail.com. I'm going to have a website's nearly done and nearly up, um, which will just be um, ceciliamayor.com.au. Um, so very soon that'll be up. Um, Beautiful. A bit more info. But for now, Facebook or email is fine. Cool. And don't forget to join the fight, kick out able-bodied people out of those disabled car parks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Warriors. Nothing wrong with the friendly keying of the car if it comes from love. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, great. And, uh, um, thanks what, for love. Yeah. That's Look, love you guys lots. Cecilia, have an awesome day. We'll chat soon. And, guys, take it easy. Rock and roll. Yeah.